Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, and I'm the co-founder, chief medical officer, and the executive vice president of the nonprofit CLL Society. And my friend Nathan is going to introduce himself to you now. Hi, my name is Nathan Vardy. I'm currently a managing editor at MarketWatch, and I am the author of For Blood and Money, a book about the development of two rival cancer drugs that have specifically made a huge difference for CLL patients. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Nathan, as a finance writer, why did you decide to write a book on something that a lot of people might find dry, regulatory and the levels of financing about drug development? What drew you to this topic? For many years, I was a senior editor at Forbes where I was responsible for the coverage of big investors, hedge funds, private equity, that sort of thing. And that meant that every day I was covering a different industry, oil one day, streaming services the next, whatever people were investing in. And in the period 2010 to 2020, the area that I found most interesting and dynamic was biotechnology. There just wasn't an industry that was, in, in my opinion, impacting human beings like biotech. And within biotech, the story that I write about in this book was, was to me the story that epitomized this area that I think of as, as kind of the biotech boom and, and, and the golden age of biotechnology, you know, more than any other story. And I also thought it was a really good story uh, that was extreme in, in its nature. And the end of it we know is unambiguous. It, it, the outcome for patients is a very good one. So I was really just trying to reverse engineer how did, how did we get to here? Um, and, and I just thought it would be a, a good read. So Nathan, I'm going to ask you for a little bit of inside baseball here. The, what, one of the things that I really loved about the book, and I recommend it to anyone uh, to read, it's a great read, um, is that you didn't just talk to the investors, the billionaires, um, but you were talked to a lot of patients, you talked to a lot of people um, who were kind of on the sidelines of this, uh, people who were the researchers. How did you go about deciding who to talk to and put the story together? Because that's one of the things that I found most intriguing was you had all these different perspectives. Um, you know, I, no one person uh, can create a cancer drug that makes a difference. Um, it, in the end of the day, it's many, many different people who accomplish something that none of them could do by themselves, uh, including the patients. I mean, the patients are at the core not only um, is the whole point to help patients, but um, without the heroic and, and, and courageous patients who volunteer for clinical trials, we can't, we can't have these drugs. Um, and so my goal was to show all the different, obviously I wasn't able to, to hit everybody, but, but to show all the different kinds of people that contribute uh, to, to these sorts of outcomes. Um, and definitely investors play a very big role. So do the physician scientists. So do the people who are working in the cubicles and offices of different biotechnology companies and in the medical centers and, and the patients. Um, and so that was kind of the, the goal that I had for the book. Now, when I read the book, it seemed to me almost miraculous that this drug that was really not developed to be used in humans because of the way it bound, and I'm talking about PCI3765, which later became ibrutinib, made it across the finish line and has helped tens of thousands of people, myself among them. Did, can you give us a little bit of what you've learned from looking at how this seems so unlikely? There's so many places that this could have just fallen apart. And there's so many, I mean, so many intriguing little diversions and detours, um, both in the development of ibrutinib and calibrutinib, which you talk about. Could you talk a little bit about kind of how you see that journey and how this happened to make it over the finish line? It's incredible to think that for all the billions of dollars that are spent on cancer research and all the cutting edge uh, and innovative science, and all the smart people, that luck plays an enormous role in the development of cancer drugs. And you can see it in this story in so many different ways. 
You're right. Uh, the drug was originally, uh, that, that is Imbruvica today, uh, was originally developed uh, to treat rheumatoid arthritis, uh, not blood cancer. It was originally developed as a tool compound, really just to study the biological effects in the human body of the drug, because the drug is covalent. And at the time, covalent drugs, which irreversibly bind to their targets, were really shunned by uh, uh, the, the biotech and pharma universe. People were worried about the off-target effects that such, such drugs could have. Um, and so to think how this drug still ended up being treated uh, and used in blood cancer is really uh, a crazy uh, story with a crazy set of events. You know, one of them, for example, that I found so interesting is that um, Richard Miller, uh, the founder of Pharmacyclics, um, which was the company that developed uh, Imbruvica, um, in the phase one trial, uh, he wanted to test it in lymphoma. He, he was a lymphoma uh, guy, a lymphoma doctor, and uh, he wanted to test the, the, drug, the drug in lymphoma, and I get into reasons why in the book, um, but um, he included CLL in the protocol, and he did that because he thought it would be easier to do blood assays uh, from the CLL patients because in lymphoma, the, you know, it would be much more complicated, it would be much more invasive, but, but he could do it with just simple blood samples in CLL patients. And then when they tested the drug in, 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 in CLL patients, there were a couple, two PRs right away in, in that phase one trial. And, and then people at Pharmacyclics were like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, maybe we should pursue this in CLL and not lymphoma. So a lot of this comes down to people with really good intentions, you know, definitely well-funded, uh, trying uh, to, to use, you know, make the most logical decisions they can. And then sometimes luck plays an enormous role. Yeah, I, I, it really struck me that luck played an enormous role in this. And uh, it's, and at many points when you read through the book, there was just parts that just could have, where it just could have gone off the rails. And if it wasn't for the belief and more money invested and other things like that, I mean, it just is a, a fascinating read. Uh, are there any lessons that you think or anything that, you know, from, I'm talking about a patient's perspective that a patient, you know, might want to understand about how these drugs uh, get to be an option for us? I mean, is there something that patients should know about or something that your patients could be interacting because uh, um, obviously we're not, you know, most of us, the vast majority of us aren't in this situation where we're the physician scientists or we're the investors with those kinds of funds. So is there a perspective from the patient's point of view that you think is important to get out of your book? You know, I really wrote the book because I wanted people to understand uh, the drug development process as it exists today. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, outrage, for example, over the high price of drugs. Um, a lot of people uh, have a negative opinion of, uh, of pharmaceutical companies. And there's a real legitimate debate about all that, uh, that, that I'm very sympathetic to. Um, but I, I did want people to kind of get a sense of how, how these cancer drugs come to be. Where, where do they come from? How does this happen? And I think um, for patients, it might be be interesting for them to get a sense of that, uh, of what goes into, the, you know, again, in, in this case, it's unambiguous. It's a very, very good outcome. Um, and so I, th I think that patients, you know, might enjoy or might appreciate, uh, you know, just under, you know, getting insight into, in, into how this drug development process actually works. Um, because, you know, for many people, they don't even try, they don't think about these things until they are personally or indirectly impacted by cancer. And then suddenly it becomes very front and center. Um, so anyways, I, I think it might, it might be interesting for them to, 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 to get a kind of inside take on it. And one of the things that I liked about the book is you, there's three areas that it touched on. There's a lot of areas that it touched on, but one was the finance piece, which was all news to me. And I, that's one of your areas of expertise. The other was the regulatory piece and interactions with the FDA. 
and a third was the science piece. And I guess if a fourth, it was all the personalities <laughs> was a whole other piece. Um, so I'm very grateful to have those kinds of insights. And there was whole areas that I didn't know. Um, any final thoughts that you wanted to share with the patient and caregiver communities? Um, all of us are so grateful to have these uh, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib and new generations coming along. Um, any, any final thoughts that you wanted to talk about this sort of from discovery to development to commercialization that you think patients um, should know about? Only that, and I know I think they know this, or I hope they do, is it was a central role patients play in this entire process. You know, I, I dedicated the book to patients uh, who, all patients who volunteer uh, for, for clinical trials, uh, because without them, uh, none of this, none of this happens. And I think it's kind of interesting how uh, you have this multi-billion dollar industry. And you're right, I, I talk about the money. I think the you know, money and finance plays a central role in drug development today. I'm, I don't shy away from that. Um, uh, and, and definitely uh, all of this is done in order to produce products. But at, at the end of the day, it's not just for the patients. Without the patients, none of this would happen. They, they play such a central role in all of this, I think it's a complicated thing, you know, volunteering for a clinical trial, which trials to to participate in, what how the doctors uh, uh, um, uh, recruit and 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 put people in trials, um, some of the ethics involved, which I also get into in the book, uh, especially when you have randomized trials that put people in different arms, um, and so I I just think this, the patients are at the core of it, and and I. I would hope that any patient who would read this book would come away really uh, understanding and, and appreciating what a central role they play. Nathan, as a patient and as someone who entered a clinical trial, phase one trial, of uh, the drug that just had numbers and didn't have a name, um, I'm so grateful uh, for the insights that uh, your book uh, uh, provides, um, things that I just didn't know about. And I I recommend it. CLL Society doesn't make a dollar off of you reading the book, but I recommend that uh, this is a real interesting read. Um, and we'll give some links to how people can get a hold of the book. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, let's stay in touch. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I'm so impressed with the uh, service that the CLL Society uh, provides for patients. I know it's an incredibly appreciated resource by CLL patients uh, and their families. Um, and it was a real privilege to get to tell that a little bit of that story in my book and, and to speak with you here today. Thank you. And, and thank you for mentioning the CLL Society and myself and uh, my friend Terry Evans got a little bit of a walk on part in the book. So I'll give that out as a teaser that um, you'll see yours truly um, appearing in the book. So thanks so much. It's a pleasure, thank you.